So as is the case in most mathematics, we don't want to just be able to go forward. So when we talk about an exponential function, we also need to talk about its inverse, which is basically going backwards. And that's a logarithm. So logarithmic functions are the inverse of exponential functions. And so we can actually write out a log using the same variables or parameters as a function. Here we have our base, which should sound familiar. We have what's called the argument, which is a bit of a new term. And then we have the exponent. Now, we can rewrite this as our more familiar exponential function as well. The base should be familiar. The exponent, of course, is right up there. And then the argument is just the result of raising the base to the exponent. And so I kind of color coded them here, but any log can be rewritten as an exponent. So let's go ahead and rewrite this in function notation, and then we'll see that by translating it to an exponential function, we already know a lot of the traits of this function. We'll go ahead and rewrite this as an exponent. So we have a base of 10. It's kind of the common log. It's being raised to the p of x power, and then that is equal to the argument x. Okay, great. So I'm doing this for a, for a base of 10, but this would work for any of them. Again, it's just easier to work with a base that we know. So we can figure out a lot of the same things that we did in the previous example. So let's go ahead and find our critical values here. So first off, if we set p of x equal to zero, and I'm doing that because it's easier to set the exponent to zero, that's what we were doing before. So if we plug that into our parent function here, we're going to get 10 to the zero power is equal to x, or just x equals one, which of course gives us the point one, zero in this case. And again, we're seeing that inverse relationship where with an exponential function, we had zero, one as a critical value. In this one, we have one, zero. And we'll get our second critical value by replacing our output, p of x, with one. So we get 10 to the first power is equal to x in this case, or just x equals 10. So we get 10, 1 is a critical value, or more generally, since 10 was our base, what we're really getting here is B1. So now we have these critical values that can help us to graph our function. And then from there, we also know, once again, that the result here, 10 to the P of X, will always be positive. So we know that 10 to the P of X will always be greater than zero, which means x, since x is equal to 10 to the p of x, will also be always greater than zero. So let's look at our graph here and start to piece these things together. So first off, we have the two points, one at one zero, and then the second point, I'm gonna write it in its kind of generic form here. We're gonna travel out b units, however many that happens to be in our example here, it was 10 and then we're gonna go up one, right? And so now we have two points. We also know that x has to be greater than zero. Well, this is our x-axis here, and x is greater than zero as long as we're to the right of our y-axis. So let's go ahead and draw an asymptote here. So in this case, we have a vertical asymptote. And now we're gonna do the same trick we did before and just look at some values here so now that we have a few footholds, let's look at the behavior of this function. And we're going to use kind of this rewritten exponential version to do that. So in this case, instead of plugging in x's, I'm gonna plug in outputs or p of x or y's because it's easier to plug in this exponent here than it is to think logarithmically. This is one method, you don't have to do it this way, it's just the way I, tend to find easiest. So once again, we'll go ahead and pick zero for P of X. So we'll go ahead and look at what happens as our values go down. We'll start at that at zero, since that's an easy number to plug in. 
And plugging those in, we're gonna see that we get that same relationship, except now, once again, it's the inverse, the input and output have switched. So now, to write this out kind of in a limit notation or to interpret it is a little more challenging because we do want to do that in terms of x. But basically what we're seeing here is the limit as, well, what is happening to x here? x is getting closer and closer to 0. So as x approaches 0, and we say from the positive direction, then we know that p of x is going to approach, well, this is going down towards negative infinity. So it's just going down, 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 down. So we can kind of start our graph here and we see as x gets closer and closer to zero, so we're approaching the y-axis, our graph is just gonna go down, down, down. So what about as x gets bigger and bigger and bigger? Well, let's look instead at what happens when y gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And from that, we should be able to figure out kind of what's going on. So in this case, again, writing it out in our limit notation, well, we have the limit as x, well, x is going, oh, just keep going up. So the easiest way to write that would just be x is approaching infinity. Well, as that happens, we note that p of x is just going, oh, well, it's going to infinity as well. So it's approaching positive infinity. So it's gonna keep going up, up, up forever. But based off our two critical values here, we can see it behaves a little bit different than our exponential function, because instead of accelerating, it's actually decelerating. And so eventually it's going to look almost horizontal, but won't actually be horizontal. So in summary, with both logarithmic and exponential functions, and really any type of function, what we're looking for is a few critical values, any sort of domain or range restrictions, and that gives us kind of a map or footholds to get started. Then we just kind of can plug in numbers and look for what the behavior will do as x gets really big or small. And then we have a good idea of what our graph will look like and frankly, how the function is going to behave.